Great to see you at church this morning, friends. Um, always good to gather and hear God's Word and lovely to see some guests, especially here for Mother's Day. So uh, welcome to those of you in that situation. Um, today we're dealing with an issue that is somewhat politically controversial. And so it's important when we come to God's Word uh, that, that we work hard to hear what the Bible is saying and not just allow our own preconceptions. Jesus is not from the left and he's not from the right, he's from above. Sometimes when we follow the scriptures, we're going to sound a little bit right wing. Sometimes when we follow the scriptures, we're going to sound a little bit left wing. But what matters is that we follow what God teaches from the scriptures. We we'll follow the way of Jesus because the, the natural inclination of the human heart is towards sin. Uh, and we'll always feel a measure of discomfort when we hear the word of God. This week, as we think about what the scriptures say about race... Uh, it may sound a little left-wing to some of us. Next week, as Ben speaks about the issue of abortion, it might sound a little right-wing. But what matters is not that we line up with our particular political ideologies. What matters is that we hear the voice of God in Scripture. So I have it, I pray to God as we, uh, as we begin. Father in heaven, we pray this morning that you give us humble hearts to hear your word on this question of race and the, the history of Australia. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I grew up in a a farming locality called Blighty. Blighty's a a nickname for England. And almost everyone I knew was of British heritage. The world that I grew up in, Australia, was a very British world, always had been, always would be, or so it seemed to me. But there were signs from early on that there was more than that story. Uh, When we went to the local Baptist church, we went to with my family as a kid, there were a number of families that we would sit next to in church who were Aboriginal people. The Baxters and the Briggs and the Days and the Smiths and the Edwards, they sat with me in Sunday school and we, we learned about Jesus together. But then when I went to high school, my Aboriginal friends, I noticed, were socially excluded, pushed to the margin, made to feel like they didn't fit in. And the story we sometimes heard was that the, the Aboriginal people would die out and perhaps through intermarriage, their cultural identity would be lost. And it took time for me to realise the full story of our First Nations peoples, to comprehend that an immense tragedy has engulfed Australia since 1788, when British immigrants first began to colonise this country. And there's a there's kind of a great wound that still sits in Australian culture, a wound that we're not that will not heal unless we're honest about our past and our and our story. You see, for my people and for most immigrants, Australia is the land of opportunity. It's the land of freedom. A lot of us feel that. But for the Aboriginal people, the British did not come as settlers, but as invaders. And the truth is that the freedom and opportunity that that we enjoy has actually come at great cost to the Indigenous people of this country. On my mum's side, Thomas Hiscock came to Australia in 1840 as a blacksmith, Worked hard at, at, to make a living at Bunanyong near Ballarat. On my dad's side, William Wilson came to Australia in 1882 as a poor immigrant from Ireland and he worked hard in the building industry and neither of those men sought to do wrong to the First Nations people of this country. They were just part of a, a mass immigration that resulted in great loss to the First Nations of this country. Loss in life, loss in language, land, culture law and knowledge that have built up over many generations. And this morning I want to do something a little different from our normal message. Instead of unpacking one chapter of the Bible, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, that'd be a kind of an exegetical sermon, what we're going to do is bring into focus what the scriptures say about this one issue, about race and how it's played out in the history of our nation in Australia. And I want to do that under four big doctrinal headings, creation, the fall, redemption and new creation. So let's start with creation. All creation belongs to the Lord. He made it, he owns it, but he allows different people to live on his land at various times and he made the people who live on the land. In Genesis chapter 1 we read these words, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. So when you meet a human being, you're meeting someone who bears the image of our Creator. 
all humans have dignity as people in His image. And how we treat our fellow human beings tells us something of how we think about the one whose image we bear. Which is why taking life has always been such a serious thing. So in in Genesis chapter 9 verse 6 we read, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed for in the image of God has God made mankind. And this of course means that human life has value, regardless of how old or young they are. So next week we'll be addressing the question of abortion. Human life has value regardless of how wealthy they are, how intelligent they are, or how productive they are. And of course, human life has value regardless of their racial heritage, the colour of their skin or the language they speak. So when the the British sent Captain James Cook to sail south on the Endeavour back in 1768 to try and discover the, the great south land, there was a recognition of the dignity of human life even in faraway places. And Cook's instructions when he found the Southland included these words on the screen, with the consent of the natives to take possession of convenient situations in the country in the name of the King of Great Britain. Think about those words, with the consent of the natives. That consent, of course, was never obtained. In fact, it would have been almost impossible to obtain The Aboriginal people were in fact many nations with many languages and cultures which were totally foreign to Cook and even if they had taken taken the time to learn the language, the people simply may not have been willing to give consent, which would have been perfectly reasonable. I imagine if the Indonesians came to obtain land in Australia and Joko Widodo um, came and said, "I, I want some land, we might have said, look, we'll give you some space for an embassy but you're not having our land. So the Navy told Cook to seek consent, perhaps out of respect for the unknown people who lived here, but it was a recognition that we ought to rec- respect people from other lands, that, that it's wrong to just take land. This brings us to our second major biblical doctrine, the doctrine of the fall. The Bible says that, tells us that sin is the natural inclination of the human heart. As early as Genesis chapter 6 verse 9, we read, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. It's pretty uh, pretty strong words. But from the fall of Adam, the the human race has resisted God's will for our lives. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are enslaved by sin and that sin defiles us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter, in Mark chapter 7, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. It is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Jesus taught that sin is not just something out there, it starts in here. And one example of it is theft. So on the 22nd of August, 1770, Cook claimed the east coast of Australia in the name of the king. He did not follow the instructions he was given to seek the consent of the natives. But more importantly, he broke the law of God. Well known in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, you shall not steal. In the name of the king, Cook stole a whole continent. That's painful to say because in many ways... Cook was a very fine man, but, but the act of stealing a nation was sin and it was done by my people. He coveted a land that was not his own. Now, we could say, well, you know, if the British hadn't taken the land, then someone else would and definitely the French were interested. Uh, they visited Australia about the same time as the First Fleet. But saying someone else might have committed the same sin does not make it okay for my people to commit that sin just tells us that the problem with the human heart is across all peoples. And if Cook's claims had been kind of left there and forgotten, it may not have had many consequences. But in 1788, we're talking 18 years later, uh, the first fleet arrived in Australia, began to colonise Australia. And I wonder if they realised the irony of it all. 
that people who had stolen a loaf of bread were sent as convicts to live in a land that the government had stolen the whole land from its owners. And what started as theft developed into a whole series of other sins, murder, rape and much more. And once the British believed they had the right to take the land, any resistance by the Indigenous people was met with violence. The Indigenous people were treated like they were doing wrong for defending their land. And as the British spread out across Sydney, pitched battles were fought between government troops against the Indigenous people at at Richmond, West Sydney, 1795, at Parramatta, 1797, at Bathurst in 1824 and at Pinjara in Western Australia in 1834. Lawrence Threckold of the London Missionary Society described it as a war of extermination. There were many massacres and it makes for painful reading today. Often it was Christian people who defended the Aboriginal people and who reported the massacres, and, and, but sadly, sometimes they participated as well. Waterloo Creek, 26 January 1838, a campaign against the Aborigines was led by Major James Nunn. His deputy, George Coban, later claimed four or five people had died. His sergeant, John Lee, said it was about 40 or 50 while the missionary, Lancelot Threckold, put it at between two or three hundred people. You see, the missionaries knew and loved these people and they were willing to speak up about the atrocities and were often condemned for doing so by the squatters. The Mile Creek Massacre in June 1838 is one of the most notorious. At Mile Creek on the Liverpool Plains in northern New South Wales, 28 unarmed Indigenous men, women and children were tied to a rope and stabbed to death by 12 colonists. They were reported by Christian missionaries and for the first time in Australian history they were held to account and after two trials, seven were found guilty and hanged. And at the time, a Baptist preacher in Sydney, John Saunders, preached a powerful sermon against what had happened at Mile Creek. In part, he said these words, "'We have wronged him without any sanction,' that I can find in either natural law or God's law. We, we descended as invaders upon his territory and took possession of his soil. It is not just to say that the natives had no notion of property and therefore we could rob them of what they did not possess, for accurate information shows that each tribe had its distinct, had its district locality and each superior person in the tribe a portion of this district. From these hunting grounds, they have been individually and collectively dispossessed. Comes home to me a bit more personally, because back in the 1970s, I remember as our stock agent used to help us sell our cattle, came and sat on our back veranda with us one day and over hot tea told us how his grandfather used to go down to the the Edward River in Deniloquin and shoot the Aboriginal people like they were kangaroos. He was never held accountable for his actions. The Aboriginal people that were shot were not taken to hospital. It's hard to comprehend that it happened. But it helps me understand why the Aboriginal kids at my high school were treated so badly. And that story could be repeated across Australia. How did it play out here in Victoria? Well, in 1835, John Batman came to Port Phillip from Tasmania settled in what is now called Melbourne on the banks of the Yarra River and negotiated a treaty with the Aboriginal people and agreed to buy thousands of hectares of land from them. But the treaty was not recognised by the government in Sydney. Governor Burke in Sydney made a proclamation. He says that people occupying land without authority from the government would be considered as illegal trespassers. This proclamation implemented the doctrine of what we call, became known as terra nullius, the idea of empty land, it's a Latin word for empty land. The idea that before before the becoming of the British, the land belonged to no one. Now, there were people at the time who recognised that the Aboriginal people had land rights, but the law that followed applied the principle of terra nullius. And of course, it's simply not true. But it gave opportunity for dispossession of the land. And it was not until a referendum in 1967 over a hundred years later, that we agreed to count the Aboriginal people as citizens in this nation. Well, my great-great-grandfather, Thomas Hiscock, arrived, came to Victoria only five years after Batman. 
And in 1851, while he's working as a blacksmith outside of Ballarat, he discovered gold while looking for a stray cow. The government gave him a thousand pounds reward for his trouble, and that was the beginning of the Ballarat gold rush. And Victoria boomed from the wealth of the land. But the problem is, that was Aboriginal land. Land that only 15 years before had never had a European foot laid on it. But land that, according to Governor Burt, was terra nullius, empty land. And as we think about this, what does all that mean? I own a house in Doreen. I bought it according to law. I paid good money for it. So did many of us. But there's no avoiding that it once belonged to the Wurundjeri Willem clan of the Cullen Nation and they were dispossessed. How might we feel if if the Chinese government sent an army to Australia and claimed it as their own and gave my house to a, a Chinese family? And the law and the education and the government were all in Chinese from then on and they might tell me what a blessing it is that we now have all the benefits of Chinese culture. And if I didn't like it, that would be my problem. So what is the way forward? What is the way forward for my family, for our church, for us as a nation when these are facts are part of our history? The Europeans of Africa returned the land to the indigenous owners, the British left India, the Dutch left Indonesia, the French left Vietnam. Why has it not happened here? The plain truth is that we, the colonisers, are overwhelmingly in the majority. Only 3.3% of our population is indigenous. And that doesn't make it right. In New Zealand, Canada, the USA and every other Commonwealth country, a treaty has been established with the Indigenous people of the land, but not here in Australia. But the question might be, did God give the land to the British? In the same way that he he gave the land of Canaan to the Jews, it's a common misunderstanding and it needs to be looked at a little bit closer. See, the Lord told Abraham and later Moses the boundaries of the land he was giving to them. You read about it in in Genesis and in Exodus, Exodus here, I'll establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I'll put, I'll give into your hands the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. And we're told later that they were driven out because of, of the cruelty of some of their practices, including child sacrifice. But these are the boundaries of the land. And it is why the Jewish people have never tried to take over the world and build a great empire. You think about the story of Jonah for a minute. Jonah went to Nineveh on his own and he preached and called the city to repent. He did not, God did not send an army to conquer because it was not part of the promised land. Just sent a preacher. Think about Jesus when he gave the Great Commission to his disciples. He did not tell them to gather a great army and go conquer Rome. They simply preached the gospel and were persecuted greatly for their trouble. But after 300 years, Rome became Christian. The emperor of Rome was Christian. And the Lord did not tell the English to conquer the Australian Aboriginals. That is not in the Bible. How different it would be out in our history if instead of sending the navy the British had sent gospel preachers to love the people and share the good news of Jesus with them and what a difference it might have made to where we are now. See, the reality is the Aboriginal people have actually been incredibly receptive to the Christian gospel. According to the census in 2017, 90% of Indigenous Australians profess to be Christian, while only 52% of the Australian population as a whole profess to be Christian. Yet despite everything that's happened, the Indigenous people have been far more open to receive Christ than the rest of us. Many, many are enormously grateful for hearing the gospel of salvation of Christ. Let's get back to our Bibles for a few moments here. I want to ask you a different kind of question. What is the greatest wrong in our society right now? What is the greatest evil? If if you watch the news, you might say racism, which is a terrible wrong. But racism is is only a symptom of something much worse. See, Jesus gave two commands. The second command, the second most important command is to love your neighbour as yourself. 
what's the greatest command? The greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. So it makes sense that the greatest sin is to break the greatest command, to fail to love the Lord. The second greatest command is to love your neighbour and it is a horrible thing to do evil to your neighbour. But think about that command. The greatest command is to love God. That, that command is not there because God is kind of precious and fussy and needy, but because He is the source of the totality of our lives. We owe Him everything, life and breath and everything else. He is the one most worthy of praise and glory and honour in the universe. And He is the one we've turned our backs on. So that the, ultimately the greatest need of humanity is to be reconciled to God. And that is a very different way of seeing the world compared with the way our contemporary culture thinks about it. That there is a, a vertical relationship with God that is primary. That's what Jesus taught. We need to see the difference between the root and the fruit. See, ask yourself that question, why does racism exist? It's because we've ripped the roots out of living in submission to God. And once we've rejected God, that poisons everything. Rebellion against God is a disease and racism is one of those very ugly symptoms. We threw off God, we wanted to be sovereign over God in our lives and now if we threw out God because he threatened my personal sovereignty, what do you think I'll do with you, a mere human, if you threaten my sovereignty? If I can do that to God and reject him, think of what I'll do to you, especially if you're not part of my tribe, not part of my family group. A couple of things fly from this. Firstly, Christianity challenges the view that racism is the primary problem in our world. Christianity says the fundamental problem is our rejection of God and the problem of sin. Secondly, Christianity provides an explanation for the presence of racism. It began because of our rejection of God, which poisons everything in our human relationships as well. The Christian faith provides explanatory power for what is wrong with the world. Thirdly, the Christian faith provides a solution. I've been talking about the four big doctrines of creation, the fall, redemption and new creation. The solution is redemption. The solution is to be restored back to our relationship with God and to produce the fruit of loving, of loving, keeping with our relationship with God. The Bible tells the gospel of Jesus completely changes the way we think about race. And the Apostle Paul... <clears throat> sorry, so if the problem is being torn away from our roots with God, which destroys our horizontal relationships and poisons everything, the solution is we need to be restored to our relationship with God. Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 writes this, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. The hostility he's talking about here is kind of the age-old hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles and God's purpose was to bring them back together to make peace. The Christian faith puts the root back where it belongs, the root, our right relationship with God and it transforms everything about the way we live together. The gospel has this power to confront racism and transform our world. See, Christianity is not a white man's religion. Have you thought about it? Jesus was a man of Middle Eastern appearance. He's not one of us culturally. We have joined him. Christianity is for all nations. And from the beginning, the Christian church was incredibly multicultural. One of the things I love about our church is the way that we come from so many nations. The gospel is not about 
just about you know, establishing heaven on earth and, and restoring all human relationships. The gospel is about being reconciled to God. That is a heaven and hell issue. There's nothing more important than being reconciled to God through Jesus. Now, there are some who push a kind of self-hatred of our nation, a self-loathing that has no resolution. But the gospel of Jesus shows us a much better way forward. So what will the gospel mean for us in Australia? I think there's a couple of gospel responses here I think are worth thinking about. One is, it's right to apologise. It's right to apologise when we've done wrong. If you know that you've acted in a racist way towards someone, if you know that you've belittled someone because of their race or because they're Aboriginal for whatever reason, if you've harboured such thoughts in your heart, it's actually time to say sorry. First to the Lord and then to any individual that you may have personally been disrespectful to. But the difficulty is, what about those wrongs that are done by our ancestors? When Thomas Hiscock came to Ballarat, as far as I know, he didn't kill any of the Aboriginal people of the land, but he did benefit from the dispossession of the land. If, my, if I discovered my great-grandfather had killed a man, impoverished his family and plundered his property to enrich himself, I want to find any living descendants and at least try and say sorry. The land that my home is built on, the land that we hope to build a church on in Yan Yin Road was once owned by the Wurundjeri Willem clan, even if it was several owners ago. Some churches have, have their land given to them by Crown Grant, which means the government stole the land from the Aboriginal people and gave it to the church. The churches should be the first to say sorry. For saying sorry, secondly, it's right to repent. Repentance is a turning away from sin and a turning to God. It's more than just feeling sorrow. It's a decision to no longer continue in the sin. Or if we are continuing to benefit from from past sins, that we seek some kind of remedy for past wrongs. But here's the question, are we guilty for the sin of our forefathers? Some of you might remember we read studied Ezekiel 18, uh, last year, and this is, is what Ezekiel 18 says, the one who sins is the one who will die. The child will sh- not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. It's clear in the old covenant that we're not punished for the sins of our fathers and mothers. But we do need to recognise the wrong of what our forefathers have done. In Daniel 9, remember Daniel was was in exile because of the the sins of his people and and this is what he prays a prayer of repentance in Daniel 9. He says, Now Lord God who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away from your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill, our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Daniel knew his people had done wrong, his own generation and the generations before, and he was confessing those sins. In Romans, Paul writes about those who reject God's ways, and so we read in Romans 1, although they knew God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death, They not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. The colonisation of Australia involved great sin. And we must not approve of that. Especially since we are the beneficiaries of those actions. And the effects of that sin are still being felt by Indigenous people today. It was sin and we need to be willing to say so. Thirdly, we need to try and find ways to put things right. Under the old covenant, when sin was committed, it was not enough just to say, sorry, compensation was required. So the famous story of Luke, in in Luke's Gospel, in Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who repents 
And when he repents, he says, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. That was the standard from the book of Exodus in the law. Now, he's not paying for the sins of his fathers. But he is recognising that it is right to pay compensation to those he's cheated. At a state level, our state government has begun to take actions to put things right. In March this year, they established a Truth and Justice Commission to hear the stories of massacres and dispossession and to recommend reforms to improve the Indigenous people's quality of life and to help guide the treaty negotiations that we'll be following in our state and how reparations could be paid to Indigenous people for past injustices. And also to work out how to to lower the devastating levels of incarceration and the extraordinary numbers of deaths in custody. I think we should support those moves by our state government. I do. I support those moves. I think we should stand by our Aboriginal people. They are our Indigenous people of our nation. They're part of our national story. We should treasure them and they have a history and knowledge of our country that goes back thousands of years. For all of them are one blood with us. That's what the scriptures say. People of all, we share one blood. We are created in God's image and many of them are our spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. I think it would be a good thing to attend the dawn service that's, that's regularly held now on, on Australia Day, um, by, put on by the NADOC committee to pay respect and hear some of the stories of Indigenous people. I wonder, I wonder if it would be better to celebrate Australia Day on January the 1st which actually remembers that when Australia was first formed as a nation on January the 1st, 1901, that was when the colonies first came together and said, we are one nation Australia. I feel like that makes sense as to be our Australia Day, but that's just my opinion. What will it mean for us as a church? What's it going to mean for us? Our elders have been thinking about this, reflecting on it, praying about it. We've been thinking that it would be good to acknowledge the Aboriginal owners of the land on which we meet. So we're thinking of putting, uh, what we're thinking of doing is before the service begins each Sunday to put up this slide just before the service commences and it says, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri Willem people of the Cullen Nation as the traditional owners of this land. We pray for God's blessing on all First Nations peoples and for a future of mutual understanding. May God unite us all in the knowledge of his Son through whom and for whom all things were made. I feel like that that would be good words just to put on the screen before our service begins. We also feel like it would be right to make an acknowledgement of country before our formal congregational meetings. Love to hear your thoughts on that. In NADOC week, which is a a special week begun actually by the Christian missionaries in, in partnership with the Aboriginal people, we want to include an acknowledgement of country as part of the the service uh, in our prayers. We've also been thinking about gospel ministry. So in addition, we'd like to find ways to support gospel ministry amongst Aboriginal people. In the past, we've supported MAF, who do great work amongst the people living in remote communities in Nullumboy, in Arnhem Land. We've been supporting that work as a church. And there's been, I don't know if you know the story, there's actually been significant revival, Christian revival amongst the Aboriginal people in Nillamboy in the last five or six years. It's been exciting news. At present, we're supporting Bible translation work by Greg and Rachel Shipp, uh, who work at Maningrinda, Maningrida in the Northern Territory, and that's another uh, blessing to our Indigenous people. But my prayer is that it would be great if we could somehow support an Indigenous gospel worker doing Christian ministry. I'd love it if we could do that as a church. Well, time to start wrapping this up. I said at the start, we think about creation, the fall, redemption, new creation. Let's just quickly look at the doctrine of new creation and, and take us to the scene in the book of Revelation at the last day where we read these words, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. It's a glorious picture of heaven. 
when the Lord will gather people from every tribe, nation, language, and it reminds us that before God, there is no such thing as cultural superiority, that we all rely on salvation from the Lord. Without Him, we face His judgment, but that with Him, we look forward to that day when we'll see His face and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's where we're headed, friends. How about I pray and then we'll open for questions for a few minutes. Father in heaven, you are the creator of all things, of all people. We confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. That we failed to love our neighbours as we should and in particular we acknowledge today that the settlement of this land of Australia and the dispossession of our First Nations people, that those things involved a great sin. And that we'll still see the effects of this now like a great wound that needs to be healed. Father, help us to be honest about these things. Father, where we have harboured the sin of racism in our own hearts, please forgive us and change us. Please help us to reach out in love toward any who are different to us in language or culture or appearance. And Father, we pray for your blessing on all First Nations people and for a future of mutual understanding. Lord God, please unite us in the knowledge of your Son, through whom and for whom all things were made. Amen. Um, If there is neither Jew nor Greek, is it correct to say that black lives matter? Or does this single out one race over others? And does this go against God's word? Yeah, a, a, a statement like black lives matter, it's obviously incredibly fraught politically. Um, these days it's important that we say that we do say black lives matter not because they matter more than anyone else but because sadly especially in the US but also in this country black people's lives have not always been treated like they matter And, and that's why it's actually important for us to say yes they do matter now I know there's another conversation that says well do they matter more well let's just say all people are created in God's image and therefore we ought to love all people but let, let's be honest that black people have often been made to feel like their lives don't matter as much. And it's important that we say, yes, black lives do matter. They do matter. Of course, all lives matter, but black lives particularly matter when they have not been treated as equally and fair. That's why we need to say that. Um, does there come a point when Aboriginal people will need to move on? Now, I wonder if, if, if the Chinese government one day sent their army to Australia and took over our country, they'll have the power to do it in probably another 50 years. If we would feel like, well, everything's going to be Chinese for now, would we say, well, it's just time to move on and just accept that? I, I think we'd find that troubling. Um, there, there is a wound here that, that's not going to just heal by us kind of saying... Well, you, you get over it. I mean, we, there's, there's, there's sin in the past of this nation and we need to recognise it. We need to be able to say, yes, it was wrong. Yes, we find a way forward and, and there does need to be for us to find ways of reconciliation and, and our, I'm, I'm thankful that our Victorian government is looking to try and find ways to put things right. I think that's, I think that's important that we do. Um, but we can't just ignore, you know, if, if I come and stole someone's car and I, and I, and I, uh, and you, you, and maybe I sold it on to someone else who sold it to someone else, eventually that, maybe that third owner would have that car claimed by the police and say, no, no, yeah, that, that car's a stolen property. Um, that, the original owner of that car would still feel like, hey, you, you got my car. Where's my compensation for this? There's a complicated thing. Sin, one of the problems with sin is that it creates layers and consequences. That it, it, You do a sin here and it just creates a whole flow on effects. And, and so we, we need to just find ways to be honest about where it's gone wrong, to reach out in love. Um, and, uh, and, and seek to, to find reconciliation as we move forward in the future. 
How should Christians respond to claims of historic church complicity in the mistreatment towards first Australians? I, I think with sorrow. We ought to say, I'm, you know, it, it should move us that the Christians could be part of that. It's, it's a terribly sad thing. I, I, I haven't read reports of that, but I've no doubt that it has happened. Um, I, I certainly know that many Christians worked hard to defend Aboriginal people and, 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 and the missionaries particularly really worked hard to stand by Aboriginal people. But, but where Christians have been complicit, we should feel the sorrow of that. It might not have been me or anyone in our church individually, but we ought to say, hey, we're, part of, we, we're, we're delighted that we're part of a history that goes back to the, the Reformation and I'm pleased to feel that connection, but also have to feel that connection when... Christian people are sinning, Christian people are sinning in all sorts of ways and we're feeling that in the, the Royal Commission at the moment into abuse and, uh, and there needs to be times where we go, that was wrong. But the beautiful thing about the Gospel, it says to us, yes, wrong has occurred but you can be forgiven, you can be restored, that God will bring you into his family, count you as his children, call you loved and that there will be this great gathering on the last day where we'll be united with people from all sorts of backgrounds and that somehow in the cross of Jesus a reconciliation, a great payment is made so that there will be people we meet in the new creation from from places and countries that that the British will have hurt and they'll be standing there as brothers and sisters and will have joy because in Christ that is paid for. It's the beauty of the gospel. But in the present, let's, let's be aware there are things to work through things to work through. Any other questions? I think let's keep praying, working this through. This is, uh, this, in me, in my reading and research on this, I felt really confronted and I'm sure some of us are feeling quite confronted by some of the things I've said today. Can I just ask you to, to let's try and think about it biblically. Let's try and think that, yes, sin has occurred. It's hard to hear. It's hard for someone up the front to say that. Um, and if, if we're aware of hardness in our own heart, let's just ask God to change us and soften us. Um, this is where we're headed. We're headed for that last day. Every tribe, nation and language will be gathered before the Lord. And we want to have joy in that day.